I want to welcome you to this uh, roundtable at the Helix Center. I'm Edna Sessian, the director of the center. Today's roundtable and tomorrow's on men-men uh, -man competition was proposed and organized by Maxine Schist Johnson, who is here. Uh, just one announcement is that the program we have with the program tomorrow, we end the October month, and then in November we have a round table on um, animal language. Wow. Uh, so I will introduce Maxine, and then she will introduce the other participants. Maxine Shiz Johnson is a philosopher whose first life was a dancer, choreographer, professor of dance, and a dance scholar. She has an ongoing courtesy professor appointment in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Oregon. And she has published numerous articles and a number of books. Her books are The Roots of Thinking, The Roots of Power, Animate Form and gender, Gendered Bodies, The Roots of Morality, The Primacy of Movement, and The Corporeal Turn and Interdisciplinary Readers. She received an MA in dance and a PhD in dance and philosophy from the University of Wisconsin, where she also studied evolutionary biology. She was awarded a distinguished fellowship for her studies of xenophobia by the Institute of Advanced Study, Durham University, the United Kingdom, in its inaugural year, the theme of which was the legacy of Charles Darwin. Maxine. I'm going to just stand up for this part because I want to introduce uh, all of you to everyone here. But first, I would like first uh, to thank Ed Nersessian and Mary for their wonderful hospitality. Uh, it's been quite extraordinary. I want also to thank uh, Robert Penser for all of his work on the website. I don't know who Robert Penser is, but. Uh, Pardon? Could I? Thank you. Ah. Um, yes. Uh, for anyway, the website and all of the emails that were sent out in terms of this um, this roundtable discussion. Um, I also wanted to mentioned that I was delighted that the Helix Center had started again. I think it's just a wonderful institution, and I hope it thrives and continues because I think it's a great, wonderful thing to do for the community and for uh, being open to the public as it is. I think it's really quite a unique institution. So I would like to just say yay for the Helix Center. <laughs> Um, I also want to say that uh, one of the participants um, uh, cannot be here tonight, Linda Caporial. She has a uh, very highly seriously injured hamstring, and she could not make it from, uh, from Rensselaer Institute. So she will not be joining us. Um, <clears throat> Jesus Ilundain. Uh, we have a somewhat, uh, actually, uh, I guess, um, International, <laughs> an international, uh, uh, at least duo of participants. Uh, Jesus is from Spain and from the Basque country. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, really strange names. Uh, he is an associate professor of philosophy. He teaches very widely in the area of philosophy, everything in epistemology to uh, the kind of lowly subject of aesthetics in, in uh, philosophy. Um, and uh, he was awarded various, uh, um, he had various distinctions awarded to him from the, from the university, one of which I can't remember the name. It's the Samuel H. Graff Faculty Achievement Award in 2008 and 9, and the Allen and Pat Kelly Faculty Scholar Award. So he has been very active in promoting philosophy. His main area of interest in terms of uh, 
his life uh, as well as his <coughs> both academically and uh, real life is uh, sports um, and as he put down in his uh, self-description it's his main interests are in pedaling and swimming. <laughs> uh, I want also to introduce Scott Kelso, who was founder and director for 20 years of the, of the Center for Behavioral and Brain Sciences at Florida Atlantic University. He has had a highly distinguished career, uh, is, uh, serves both in Dublin in a new, newly... Derry. In, De in Derry, Derry <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> this is in the north of Ireland. Um, in Ulster, yeah. yeah. He has a uh, visiting professorship there as well as his continuing uh, studies and work and supervisions at Florida Atlantic University. He's well known for his book on dynamic patterns and his more recent book that he co-edited with somebody from Denmark, um, uh, on complementarity. So I also want to introduce, I have never had this pleasure before, but I want to introduce my husband, Albert A. Johnstone, who is going to uh, fill in uh, as needed for um, Linda. Um, I'm sorry really that all of you weren't present, present at the very lively discussion that we had over dinner because I thought that we should all meet beforehand and have some kind of interchanges because no one knew each other really. I knew them, but they didn't know each other at all. And we had a very wonderful, lively conversation at, at dinner time, thinking about what we would talk about here. So um, that said, uh, I hope I didn't leave anything out. Um, so we were, we were going to talk about life and movement. And there are a few remarks that I just want to make just generally before we start. And that is that to begin with, we are all movement born. We are precisely not stillborn. The second thing that I would like to say is that movement forms the I that moves before the I that moves forms movement. The third thing I'd like to say is that infants aren't pre-linguistic Language is post-kinetic. I think those are major insights that can be empirically demonstrated and uh, empirically investigated and for the benefit of all. Um, Oh, I should also mention that just by way of, in case I have any lapses or stumblings, um, we are from the central Oregon coast in a little village called Yahats, which is called the gem of the Oregon coast. And it took us 21 hours to get to New York. <laughs> and we arrived at six o'clock this morning and we had four hours sleep. So if I have lapses, I hope you will please forgive me because it's just a matter of lack of fortitude. And at 82, that can be quite telling. <laughs> Um, but um, anyway, um, I wanted to mention too that the last chapter of the primacy of movement in this expanded edition that came out in 2011, that the last chapter, which is part of the expanded edition, starts out with the sentence that movement is coming to the fore, though it's not yet called by its real name. It's very often talked about in terms of embodiment, embodied subjectivity, embodied self, embodied experience, and lo and behold, even embodied movement. And that really you can find in the notable neuroscientist Francisco Varela uh, in a, an article he co-wrote with um, Natalie Depraz, who is a well-known French philosopher. And you can find it as well in a book called Embodied Cognition, which is written by a psychologist by the name of Raymond Gibbs. So the term embodiment is bandied around a lot. I call it a, a lexical band-aid because what it does is 
just, you put it in front of something and it's supposed to make everything okay because it comes from the body. So you can talk about embodied language, you can talk about embodied anything, and it doesn't really elucidate what it is that you're, you're focusing on in the way that, with the amplitude that it can or should be. Something similar can be said in terms, from my way of thinking, in terms of the, uh, an inactive approach which uh, also slides by the realities of movement because it ends up being not only um, an active approach but in terms of inaction, but then you have to embed the body and you have to extend the mind and you have to, um, uh, what is the other thing that they talk about? Uh, oh, well, just embodied minds they talk about, embodied minds uh, which are embedded and then extended. So anyway, they're not really, to my mind, getting at the heart of movement, which is dynamics. And until you realize that movement is about dynamics, it seems to me that you don't really get to understanding uh, movement at all. And in terms of, of the life and movement roundtable itself here tonight, it's interesting that someone, when it was mentioned that it was going to be about life and movement, that that was the title, someone said, oh, you're going to talk about animal communication. <laughs> life and movement has... <laughs> pardon? <laughs> That has to do with, life and movement has to do with us as living, moving beings. So I think it's really important that we uh, bring this topic up for discussion. Um, then I just wanted to mention a few uh, quotations. One is, one is from Aristotle. Aristotle wrote that nature is a principle of motion and change. We should therefore understand what we mean by motion, because otherwise nature would not be understood at all. The second person that I'd like to just refer to is a, a philosopher by the name of Edmund Husserl, who is the founder of phenomenology, who said and wrote about the fact that I move precedes I do or I can do. And, but what, what he meant by I can do is not simply I can run and I can jump and I can do these things, but I can calculate, I can judge, I can do all these things, but in the beginning, everything proceeds from I move. All of our repertoire of I cans is generated on the principle of I move. And finally, I would like to, to cite Darwin, who wrote that experience shows that the mind cannot be understood by attacking the citadel itself. Mind is a function of body. We must therefore understand, no, we must therefore find and argue from some stable foundation from which, uh, uh, wait a minute, I got that mixed up. Uh, um, we must bring some stable foundation from which to argue. We must bring, some, and he underscored stable. So that was, uh, experience shows the problem of the mind cannot be solved by attacking the citadel itself. The mind is function of body. We must bring some stable foundation to argue from. Now, I wouldn't say that we need to argue from that, but we need to show it. And the problem is that what? I mean, if you say to somebody, what? Study movement? How can you study movement? It won't stay still. So with that, we will start our discussion. <laughs> and hope we can pin it down. <laughs> so uh, I thought that we might start out with this uh, question of life and movement with respect to... Uh, I didn't finish introducing Bert. Does it, I'm having a, one of my lapses from... Uh, Bert is a philosopher, uh, also a courtesy professor at the University of Oregon. He's currently writing a book called The Panculturality of... Pan the, on the Pan-Cultural Human. And he's just uh, uh, 
published uh, an article having to do with emotions, uh, which ties emotions to basic somatic responses, which is a very interesting article, and it's published in a journal called Husserl Studies. Sorry. <laughs> So we're starting our session then on life and movement. And the first question that was generated was, what, what is the nature of life and movement? And as I said, I think that our clue comes in dynamics. So do you yeah, want to start in, yeah, Scott? I, 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 just to follow up what Maxine said, and I'm very, it's a pleasure being here this evening. It's very courageous of people on a Friday evening to come and talk about this topic and discuss it. Um, just, just to ground what uh, Maxine has been saying, uh, I uh, am an experimentalist in a way of um, matters of movement. And uh, I, I want to uh, tell you about a little study that was done, I think, by... Um, Carolyn Rove Collier, and just to just to make it clear what we're talking about here in terms of dynamics and coordination, um, uh, little babies, uh, two months old, spontaneously kick, and when they're comfortable and fed, they kick uh, quite a lot. Well, what Collier did was very clever. She uh, tied a, a string to the toe of the baby and connected it to a mobile. And so when the baby kicked, the mobile moved. And at a certain point in time, about 13 or 14 weeks of age, the baby realized, this is me doing that, right? So uh, now the baby sees what psychologists might say a connection between what they're doing and what they're seeing. And in fact, it's a very lawful relationship. You move, the mobile moves, the mobile moves, you move. It's a coupled dynamical system. So when you hear about motion and dynamics, you often think about physics. But actually, that's only part of the story. The part of the story has to do with the dynamics of the coordination. And in this case, as a scientist, you ask, what are the relevant quantities that describe this coordination between the organism, in this case, the baby, and the lawful effects that the organism has on his or her world, and vice versa? So that, when we talk about dynamics, or at least when I talk about dynamics, I'm oft, often talking about coupled dynamical systems. And the scientific questions are, uh, in terms of understanding, what are the relevant quantities that wrap up or capture the coordination? And then what form do the dynamics take? And uh, that means that actually you would want to, uh, if you could, uh, formally write equations of motion for the relevant quantities. Let me just say a few further words about this. Um, I often tell my students, you know, uh, because when people think about motion, they think about physics typically. But that's not what we're talking here about tonight. We're talking, as, as Maxine has written uh, beautifully about, we're talking about animated motion. We're talking about agency here. We're not just talking about movement as some disembodied state of affairs, but rather we're talking about uh, voluntary, purposeful activity. And often that's spontaneous, and we can go on and talk about that. So, so the, the key point then is how do we understand uh, purposeful animated movement? And you might say, well, you know, we have the physics of the inanimate. Actually, we've got very beautiful descriptions of that. But isn't it strange that we don't have a science of the animated movement? And could it be, actually, that um, 
This is something we just take for granted so much. It's so much a part of us that we take it for granted, and so we don't see the mystery in it somehow. We, we've, we've lost the, the ability to look at something and, and see that this is a mysterious process. How does it really work? And this little example of the baby suddenly realize movement forms the eye that moves before the eye that moves forms movement, in Sheets Johnson terms, is exactly like that. This is the origins of agency. Yeah? And the origins of agency in this case comes by virtue of a coupling between the organism and the environment. And the quantities that capture that are what science wants to go after, actually, in, in well-defined experimental conditions and so on. So you might, let me just say one or two further words about this, because there is an issue here, because movement is so much a part of all of us, your facial gestures, the way you speak, the way you sit, your shifting postures, all of this is part of this. You might say, well, um, uh, you know, I want to study the real thing, you know. Uh, I want to study it in the wild, uh, as it were. And uh, of course that's interesting to do that, and people are doing that. And there are fields, for example, in sports. Uh, uh, this might be a segue into Jesus. But uh, th that are studying that in real world settings. But in science, the progress has always been that there has to be an abstraction somehow. You see, uh, going back to Newton didn't give you the laws of motion for a falling leaf. The reason is that the falling leaf, if you look around you today in New York City, how do leaves fall? Well, they tumble and they rotate and sometimes they go straight down, depending on many, many factors. Uh, and the leaves are different, and so on. So, so uh, the point is that the, the apocryphal story of the apple falling on Newton's head was the abstraction. That's the key thing. He abstracted out of that the notion of a point mass. He ignored friction, for goodness sake, which is something that we uh, would find very difficult to do to ignore the, a natural property like that. And, he, and that's how he got to the essence of the problem, you see. Or Galileo rolling a ball down an inclined plane. Uh, somehow now from there you go to the motions of the planets. This is what one would say a science of movement could be about. That's to say we, we need to see what the abstractions are so that we can do the uh, dynamics on those uh, relevant uh, variables, yeah? And so the, in, in my own case, the, the inspiration for that came from a very, very strange place because when I was a, a graduate student in Wisconsin, uh, people were talking about movements as uh, uh, strings of uh, reflexes or as a consequence of cybernetic devices that have reference mechanisms and comparators, and you compare feedback to those reference mechanisms, and you adjust the program of movement and so on. But none of this uh, actually uh, gives you much insight into the nature of spontaneous movement behavior. And uh, actually, for that, one had to go uh, to other places, I think, and ask, in general, how do patterns in nature form spontaneously in the first place? And there you have to uh, broaden the entire issue. So perhaps that is enough. I think the key point here is that uh, agency is, uh, arises out of a coupling with the world, and that uh, uh, to do a science on that, uh, you have to find out what the relevant quantities are and their dynamics. You cannot say this is a force, this is an amplitude. We don't know often what the relevant quantities are to, to proceed and, and, and do scientific research. And the third thing would be uh, that uh, let's not take the whole thing for granted because that's what we've done. And the whole issue of agency is tied up with movement and we have to make the appropriate abstractions. Yeah. Do you want to respond to that, Jesus? Well, I know some has <laughs> in response and they elaborate. <laughs> yeah. I think that maybe um, complements what you're saying. Mm -hmm. 
it's kind of we're talking about the abstractions and the calculations, right? That you go into movement and you abstract what's common to it, and you know how things coordinate in systems and so can, on. Can you hear back there? Can you hear me there? Oh, okay. I'll talk a little louder. <laughs> um, but I guess where I'm coming from, as somebody who looks at philosophy and sport together, I want to bring more the qualitative aspect of things instead of so much the quantity. Uh, and look at it in terms of formula, which are very needed to understand things on one level. I want to also maybe capture what does it feel like to do something? And, and where does this quality come from? And maybe to bring it back to the, the issue of coordination, just today or I was waiting for, for dinner. I went for a little walk. And I saw this young lady with a little puppy. And she wasn't walking the dog, she was running the little dog. They're running down the street. She's laughing, and they're both kind of doing like a little tag team. She runs ahead, it runs ahead, you know. And just think, looking at her and the puppy running, it made me think, well, what is this about life and movement in this image right here? And uh, the way I would look at it, uh, as, uh, it would be in terms of, and maybe you can tell me what are the neural underpinnings and how this works, you know, at a deeper level. But the way I look at it was in terms of, um, well, there's a certain exuberance to life, an exploration of possibilities, if you will. Of what's possible, the puppy is trying to see how to move in the world. It's running around and doing different exploratory movements. There is also an expansion of the possibilities of those movements that comes with that as well. And, and as well, there was a coordination. They had to coordinate two of them so as they couldn't tangle with each other. Mm -hmm. So we look at coordination at, at a higher level, trying to see, well, in a way, they are collaborating. And uh, the way, for example, philosophical sport will look at this is quite often for a long time, people looked at a movement in sports or in other aspects of life in terms of competition, in, in, in a kind of um, zero-sum game. Something has to prevail here and so on. And there are new models that are coming out to, to try to explain more in terms of collaboration or cooperation, trying to say, well, the fact that there may be two athletes or, or two beings trying to be in the lead, like the puppy and the young lady, doesn't mean that they have to be a, they have to be a winner and a loser. There could be a way of cooperating, such that we both, both of us win. But we have to come up with a different framework. And here comes the quality, right, to some extent. In you pushing me and me pushing you, we bring the best out of, the, the, the best out of ourselves in whatever activity we care about, for example. And I think something important about, about movement, the way we experience it as, as human beings, is the fact that it's meaningful to us in a very, very concrete manner. When we're moving about, there are some movements that speak to us. If we're walking, it could be skating, dancing, swimming, or something else. There is a way to explore the richness of life in this way, I think. Um, and, I, and, I, and it seems to me that by looking at this in different levels, whether we're looking at it you know, with mathematical equations or, or, or trying to look at it um, from a choreographer's perspective, as a choreographer or as an athlete, um, there are ways to try to understand movement that pay attention to what it is like as a lived experience. And to do that, I would like to say that we also have to, in addition to, to doing laboratory experiments, which I think are very needed to understand what happens really at the, the inner working, so to speak, um, I think it's also important to, to look at practices that show us maybe movement in different gradations. And that's what interests me about sports, for example. Um, you have the level from a novice to an expert. I'm very interested in extra, in extra movement. People who do things to an extremely good level of things. Could be a dancer, an Olympic athlete, a choreographer, or could be maybe somebody who um, maybe makes uh, swords or cabinets. But they have particular movements honed to perfection. What does it tell us about what's possible for us to move like? I think in a way they're also inspiring to us. So the way I look at it also is not so much uh, in terms of uh, dynamics, but also in terms of high matters for our existence. I find that it's coming very inspirational. They show us different ways to move that we didn't think of otherwise. Well, I never thought of moving that way, maybe. So the way that I'm interested in looking at movement, and I think that um, it's important, and maybe we can bring it to spontaneity later and so on, is how um, certain activities, what I like to call active pursuits, that happen through movement, help us to, to nurture a way to excel as beings that, you know, in a way we're put together to move in the world. And I think life and movement, they are in a way two sides of the same coin. Life expresses itself through movement. It can't be otherwise. The moment you have passivity, you have death. Okay? So I think by trying to explore these possibilities and exploring life also enriches our lives at different levels. Both as a scientist or, 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 or 
or a philosopher or a historian or so on. There are different ways to look and tap into this. Mm -hmm. So what we cannot help do is, is move. And I think trying to explore it and understand is very important. To me, I'm very interested in exploring possibilities. Because um, like Ortega Gasset, who was a Spanish philosopher, used to say, um, we come to life full of possibilities. But life itself prunes them very quickly. So the more you explore, the more that's possible, the more that actually you're going to enrich and enjoy life to some extent. And I think part of that involves, and I'm going to close with this, is being, being able to be creative and spontaneous. Okay? The sports, what I find interesting is they, they give you very clear constraints. They have rules you have to observe. So in, in basketball, you cannot kick the ball into the hoop. Of course, very difficult. Now you would want to do it that way. But, or in soccer, you cannot use your hands, right? So they give you constraints within which to be very creative, if you will. Through these constraints, we're, we learn to use our imagination to solve practical artificial problems. We can also learn about our movement in those constraints as to how we are creative and how to actually be spontaneous. What is a spontaneous movement or creative? Are they the same or different? So these are some of the questions that I can ask myself with regard to movement. And I think maybe that's a preamble for myself. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to follow up on one thing, but let me ask Bert if he has any questions or comments. Sure. <clears throat> if you're going to talk about movement, it seems to me there are three other things you have to bring in automatically. I mean, if you're talking about human movement uh, and not the movement of a robot, for example, um, you have to bring in consciousness. Okay. When I'm unconscious, I don't do anything very interesting. You know? um, and I don't think I'm exceptional in that regard. You, you have to be conscious, and your awareness, what you know, comes into play and so forth. You know, uh, your uh, acquired skills or acquired knowledge. Um, but you need consciousness. You also need um, feeling. If you don't, if a human doesn't feel, it's not going to move. If a anim form of animate life doesn't feel, it's not going to move. Uh, and um, well, that gives you some kind of motive, uh, among other things, for the, for the movement. Uh, and then thirdly, you have to have spontaneity. I mean, you find that in your own movement. That's the only sense in which I'm saying you have to have, to have that. That is, if you look at human experience, you will find that every time you move, you're, you're conscious, uh, you have some motivation, and you're spontaneous. I mean, uh, and spontaneity is a little bit um, puzzling as a phenomenon, because uh, you know what it is, because you're there, you exist, you exist, you know. Um, but when you're starting, when you're doing science to, to cover that, um, I find it very puzzling how, how to do it, you know. Um, and it's, it's an essential ingredient. Uh, if, when you have a feeling of some kind, suppose you feel cold, um, well, you find that you, you react automatically. You do something, you start closing off. Uh, to keep warm, presumably. Now, that, that's automatic, and that can very well be explained uh, through science. But then you get some, a further element that comes in. I can, realizing that I'm, I'm cold, I can act appropriately. I mean, huddle more or uh, you know, do whatever I feel is appropriate here. But there, I'm acting spontaneously, if you like, um, voluntarily. And um, getting that into the scientific account um, is a bit difficult. Um, the same thing is true with any emotion. You know, an emotion always starts uh, involuntarily. Uh, something or other moves you. You, you don't command your own feelings, not, not, not directly. You, you, you can do various things to get a feeling going and whatnot, but, but you, in general, you don't start the feeling. You, you get on a train that's already moving. Something is going on already. 
And what you generally do, because it's the easiest thing to do, is you go along with it. And then you try to direct it here or there and so forth. You can also not go, go along with it at all, but it takes a certain amount of training to, to do that. Um, if you're beginning to feel angry at somebody, well, uh, just to, to not, not to, to get involved uh, and, and start pushing your anger, helping it out and so forth, well, um, it's not that easy at times. Um, but the, the spontaneity or the, the voluntary um, effort that you add to your feelings is an essential part of, of emotion. And it, just as it's an essential part of, of any kind of um, action you undertake, movement you do. The, the baby you were mentioning, uh, was it she or he? Uh, it uh, kicks its foot and notices things moving up here. It kicks, the thing moves. It doesn't kick, it doesn't move. It kicks twice, the thing moves twice. It, so it, it makes that correlation between what it does spontaneity, spontaneously and what that thing is doing. And if it doesn't do it, it doesn't do it. You know, the, the two go together, right? Um, well, mm -hmm. okay. uh, I have a How couple do of things go together. It's a yes. Question, yeah? yes. The way you said it, are you saying feeling comes first, movement comes later, or it can be either way? And the same about consciousness. Is it that that kind of recognized, the, the kind of consciousness you are talking about, which is recognizing, you said, the me, rather than just being conscious? In your, in your description of the baby with the kicking, you said the baby says, this is me. Mm -hmm. So this is a recognition that goes beyond regular consciousness. And so which comes first? Are you saying the kicking then makes the baby recognize his consciousness, he's conscious of himself, or the other way around? And that also about the uh, emotion. You know, it's always it's some, it's somehow interesting the way we always like to see which comes first, the cart or the horse, you see. In this case, that was at least the point I was trying to make, that this is a coupled system. So, and Bert is amplifying that, I think, very nicely, that this, the baby realizes that this is me. I mean, we don't know what the baby is experiencing. This is an inference. But nevertheless, the fact that the baby then voluntarily kicks its leg, from first of all spontaneously kicking the leg, to then voluntarily because actually the baby then increases its uh, kicking uh, and producing the nice effect in the world, you see. So um, I, I'm not convinced that the either or which comes first is the way to see things. I, I would like to make a, a comment here uh, or two um, about what Jesus said. Uh, it's actually, we can use this sort of basic example. Um, you see, we're really asking the question, what are the, as it were, what is the significant aspect of movement? And this person sitting beside me has said, the significant aspect of movement are uh, uh, meaningful animated uh, synergies. Synergies. And the synergy is a, a checkered concept, but I think it's very, very important in the following sense, that a synergy actually is a working together. And in fact, this, this coupling of the baby and the mobile is a synergy spanning the environment and the organism. There are other kinds of synergies that people in evolutionary biology have talked about, where uh, they would have two oarsmen, one each with an oar, 
and uh, they want to cross the river, well, unless they cooperate mm -hmm. with an effect here, uh, so the synergy always has an effect. It's not just a working together, but it's working together with a functional effect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, if one defects there, I mean, we've got game theory and all these things, right? Uh, repeated games and so on. But uh, defection is a one-off. It's a, it's, it matters, right? But if one defects, they'll go in a circle. Okay, everybody get that? So they have to cooperate for an effect. That is a synergy with a real effect. Now, there are other synergies that we discovered, for example, when you speak, just to pull out the properties here. Uh, imagine you have to say the word baz, as in the first syllable of a bad word, baz. And suddenly some uh, experimental arrangement. N normally when you say the word baz, just try it yourself. You're not really aware of it, but your, your jaw raises uh, with your tongue, because the tongue has to go to the roof of the mouth to produce a fricative sound, z, baz. Now imagine somebody, never experienced this before, suddenly gets a tug to the jaw. Then um, uh, how does the system compensate? Well, the fact is that uh, 30 milliseconds later, the tongue is increasing its activity, because you measure the genioglossus muscles of the tongue, which raise the tongue, the tongue is already moving to get to the roof of the mouth in 30 thousandths of a second. Now, to get the synergy idea here, the jaw and the tongue are not mechanically linked. They are not mechanically linked. No more mechanically linked than the two people with the oars. But they are, if you like, informationally linked. They're coupled. And in fact, the, the, uh, the, the synergy here is spanning the entire collection of elements that are necessary for the achievement of the goal, mm -hmm. the purpose. Uh, you can easily change the context. Synergies are context, beautifully, exquisitely context dependent. So just change the context uh, and say bab instead of baz. Well, the tongue doesn't do a darn thing then. It's the upper lip, and the upper lip is not mechanically coupled to the jaw. So these are remote compensatory effects happening in, you know, a physiologist might say, reflexively, but they have the creativity and the generativity required to produce an outcome, and that is the functional synergy. That is the combination, Bert, I would say, of spontaneity and agency together. You have a goal you want to produce, some little piece of environmental perturbation hits one of the members of this putative assembly, and other remote members will immediately compensate. Uh, you see, so this, uh, I, I think, it, it turns out to be quite important because you can then ask, well, how are synergies formed and how do they change? And then you're really asking questions about uh, how any pattern or any collective pattern of behavior uh, changes under what conditions and so on. So spontaneity and intentionality are intimately linked in this way. Yeah. I, if I may, I'm going to interject two things, uh, and it's backtracking a little bit. But I want to go back to Ed's question about uh, emotion with respect to movement. And that is that I, it seems to me that there's an overlooked dimension of movement, of emotions and movement, uh, in our everyday lives. And that is that emotions move through the body and move us to move in particular ways. Emotions move through the body. We don't Trust moves through the body in ways different from fear. Joy moves through the body in ways different from sadness. There are differences in the way emotions move through the body, and the way in which they move through the body moves us to move in certain ways. And it seems to me that that relationship 
substantiates a dynamic congruency in form between emotions and movement, which is why it's a formal congruency, which is why we can both feign an emotion we can pretend, oh, how nice it is to meet you when we're really thinking, oh, God. Mm -hmm. And we can also restrain an emotion instead of doing such, such and such. Instead of slapping somebody in the face, we restrain ourselves. There is a dynamic congruency between emotions and movement, which allows us to, a formal dynamic congruency, which allows us, in fact, to feign or restrain ourselves. The other thing that I just want to mention, it seems... I would say the synergies are different in those cases if you actually look at that carefully. Yes, I'm sure that they are, yeah. yeah. The, because the, the synergies of meaningful movement mm -hmm. that have to do with deeper aspects as well as the uh, what's, what's out there overtly. Um, the, the other thing, going back to um, Jesus's point about uh, excelling and also um, uh, in relation to spontaneity, it seems to me that one of the problems that we have in terms of taking movement for granted is precisely in terms of, of uh, falling into habitual ways of doing things and overlooking the the realities of the experience itself. If when we are in tune with the realities of the experience itself, we can wash dishes, you know, like this, or we can wash them and just kind of think around. We, there are all kinds of ways in which the qualitative dynamics of what we are doing can come to the fore to us. And when we pay attention in that way, we can indeed uh, uh, enlarge on the possibilities and it seems to me that people who study there's nothing wrong with studying abnormal behavior but it seems to me that the those who excel in behavior not behavior excel in movement um, uh, that was a great lapse uh, sorry <laughs> uh, that we also need to study study on the other end those who excel, not just the abnormal, but those who are at the extreme end on the other side. Um, what comes to me as a kind of insight uh, in relation to this is when I was uh, in my first life as dance, I realized that there's a great difference between moving through a form and having the form move through you. When the form moves through you, you are actually experiencing the movement. When you're moving through a form, you're doing something habitual. The spontaneity, it doesn't seem to me, is there precisely because it goes unrecognized as an experience. It doesn't come forth in a, in a real, uh, genuine way. I don't know if that makes sense to any of you, but those are two comments I would make. If we, if we could uh, maybe pause and ask how we understand uh, spontaneity. Oh, sorry. How we understand uh, the, the emergence of anything, its uh, spontaneity. Um, uh, it, it's a question of how you would actually study that, because again, it's, it's rather difficult. Um, one way would be, uh, for example, uh, that you could think of an animal, a quadrupedal creature, uh, walking. That's actually a, a good trick, how creatures walk and locomote. Every creature does. But the laws of locomotion are not really that well understood. Uh, but where the, spontane the spontaneity comes in is that animals uh, change gait. That is, they switch from walking to trotting. And they switch from trotting to galloping. It turns out that there's a lot of different gates that uh, quadrupedal creatures have. And so you could, you could start to think about, well, what analogies might you make uh, between an animal changing gait as a spontaneous event, it's a spontaneous event, and other uh, examples of spontaneous pattern formation in nature. Well, it turns out 
by, by that I mean that uh, under certain conditions you can take a system with very, very many microscopic components, like you, like all of us. At, at, at a great detailed level, at a molecular level, millions and millions and billions and all of that stuff, right? But somehow under certain conditions, they uh, form structures and patterns. And the, the, the physics of that is very interesting. It's called the physics of non-equilibrium phase transitions. So from a methodological point of view, how you go after spont spontaneity in this case is you say, could there be an analogy between an animal changing gait, which means it's changing the ordering among its limbs, and other phenomena in nature where you see the spontaneous emergence of pattern, like in fluids or in cloud patterns or in ma material uh, in different forms of matter, magnetism and so on. And the, the uh, uh, very interesting aspect is that all the features of the, uh, the gate change, the spontaneous change in coordination, uh, all the signatures of that are seen uh, uh, in that kind of a system, uh, just as the same signatures are seen in other physical systems that are open to exchanges with uh, energy and matter with their surrounds, are non-equilibrium, are non-linear, because this is a non-linear abrupt change. So the origins of spontaneity here come through these non-linear changes. And once you know that, then you can say, well, uh, uh, how do I modify that? And that means you have to bring in intentionality and learning and so on. But without knowing this, here's the key point, without knowing how spontaneous patterns arise under certain conditions, you don't really know what to modify. I call that intrinsic dynamics. You need to know the intrinsic spontaneous dynamics so that you can know what to modify. It's kind of akin in general, if you think of it in generally. Uh, you, you don't go in and try to modify a system without knowing a lot about its uh, spontaneous activities, its intrinsic dynamics. If you get what I mean. I mean, you can take that to a lot of aspects of life, actually, in society. Uh, don't, don't start interfering uh, because you don't know what you're doing. It's only when you understand the spontaneous patterns that you can now, now say, uh, this is the space that I want to change things uh, and modify. Modification happens in that space. You had a comment. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I guess what I was wondering is it seems to me that um, once you explain you know, spontaneity in this way, where you say, you know, well, eventually you have to bring in you know, intentionality and so on, but you have these you know, nonlinear changes. But what makes the difference at our level is that we, ref we have to reflect which changes to accommodate. And it seems to be there is something deliberate about it that's not accidental to some extent, right? So I'm wondering, um, is that part of the spontaneity then, our deliberation about how to work with this possibility repertoire of movements or, or, or you know, that, that we have available so that you know, we seem to pick the better ones. I don't see, for example, a paramecium who is exploring with the little tentacle, well, you know, the little mm -hmm. cilia, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to see well, what kind of movements are possible for me to get food. But I don't know to, uh, to what extent it's able to, I mean, conceptualize, you know, if you were through movements, you know, well, these are the moves that work for me and not those. Um, at what level do we bring maybe this ability to work with, with, with this, or does it happen you know, automatically? Yes, yeah, so it, it, this gets technical fast, yeah. because actually in the case of the bacterium or the paramecium, the, your point is that they have multiple possibilities. Mm -hmm. yes. And so in fact, that's the, that's, uh, that's the essential, uh, that is an essential aspect of spontaneity. Yeah. So that you can, you can uh, choose, as it were, uh, which one suits the current conditions. And that's, again, a quite general property. And it's also a, a feature of uh, uh, the kinds of order, order transitions that occur in uh, quadrupedal uh, locomotion, you see. Yeah. So it, that's a key point, having mm -hmm. many possibilities. Because often in science, people like to study 
one thing. You, so you, you study a monkey doing one thing, but the monkey has a whole range of possibilities that are never explored. And you don't know actually then uh, what the neural underpinnings of that are. The system's highly, what we say, highly degenerate. There are many ways to accomplish the same function at every known level, molecular all the way up to social signaling. And so that's we, a key feature again. Yeah. yeah, this reminds me of something that we discussed for a very little bit, but uh, to some degree at dinner, and that is, wouldn't you say that this is at, at a living level connected with kinetic intelligence? Mm -hmm. In other words, with um, the knowledge that an animal, human or non-human, brings to life itself on the basis of the bodies they are to go back to what Darwin said about mind being a function of body, to draw on that, that we all have, have a basic kinetic intelligence with respect to uh, our I cans, to draw also on Husserl, uh, what we can do and how we can possibly enlarge our repertoire of I cans. Yes. I think, you see, we're very used to thinking of this word intelligence in terms, for example, of computation and uh, kind of symbolic intelligence. Right. Uh, but going back to Darwin, of course, Darwin's worms proved to be uh, enlightening and terribly intelligent. And ants, too. And <laughs> ants, as we know, and uh, uh, termites, for example, b build beautiful structures under certain conditions. Put in some pheromone gradients, put in a little positive feedback, autocatalysis, and they start to create structures and pillars and arches. So the ant, you, you can say the ant is an architect. Well, it doesn't make any sense. You ask what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for this kind of architecture to emerge, and it looks intelligent, and we say it's intelligent, yeah. but in fact it's, as you say, it's, uh, it's a natural intelligence as, uh, in contrast perhaps to an artificial intelligence, the way we think about and it can lie dormant in many, in many, uh, underappreciated, in, in, underappreciated mm -hmm. in humans. I think because, uh, in part, because um, many times when people think of movement and uh, uh, they think in terms of exercising, and uh, if you go through these exercises, then you're going to be fit, etc. But that's really a matter of going through the motions rather than being attuned and listening to the actual experience of movement and listening to what's there dynamically, qualitatively, in the movement that, uh, that you're involved in, that, that, is, that is moving through you. Yes, it's, it's highly uh, creative and generative. Yeah. I mean, there are beautiful examples in sports of that as yeah. well, I think. Uh, there was a, just a, I don't know if anybody knows uh, soccer, but there was a great example of this where um, uh, in the, before the last World Cup, a very famous soccer player called Thierry Henry was playing for France. And they happened to be playing against Ireland, so I had a vested interest in this. <laughs> but um, uh, the ball uh, came to him um, at uh, somewhere between his knees and his shoulders. And he couldn't, uh, couldn't control the ball with his knee, and he couldn't get his head down to it, so he just used his hand. And it was called the hand of God, you see. Nope, the referee didn't see it. But it was, <laughs> it was, it was a, you know, almost reflexive. It's exactly like this very generative. He'd never done it before. It's against the rules. Right. But it accomplished the goal, you see. And that's what we're dealing with here. <laughs> and it, it, it was so, uh, uh, so reflexive. But then it's not reflexive in the case of some, you know, stimulus response kind of thing. It it's never been done before. Yeah. But it's wasn't just in that example, really? if you think about it too, is that there has to be a way in which, I mean, he used the hand because he knew his goal was to manipulate the ball to go to a particular place. He, he, he but, no other choice in a way. But he's still under, so to speak, reflectively perhaps, but he knows the goal is to move the ball to a particular place. Yes. So he has trained himself to act with a particular object in, in a particular way. So he has certain rules in, hand, in, in mind. And he comes, like you say, he's supposed to use his hand. That's what comes out spontaneously. Uh, 
while he's trying to, he's still trying to play soccer. Yes. <laughs> right? Even when he knows that the hand's not allowed to be used. It was the only thing that he could, given the goal because of controlling had, the ball. And, and there the goal is primary to the means to how to, to achieve it. Right. But it shows you, I think, beautifully the context mm -hmm. specificity, the, the generativity, the creative aspect of this, of skilled behavior. And that was a question I guess I had going back. Okay. Go this, no, this, I was just going to say that I do want to leave time to have questions and comments from all of you out there. So we'll make this the last comment. That's okay, fine. Then. Very quick. That's fine. Um, I guess I was just wondering, going back to, to something that Bert said with regard to spontaneity, is the role of, of uh, maybe not simply bottom up, let's try to, to explain um, generation spontaneity from, the, from neurons and so on, but maybe from the top down in terms of how maybe different cultures might also help us to use this formal uh, you know, um, way of dealing with emotions uh, through, you know, these formalized movements, right? But it seems like at some level we do bring a, a, a way to be deliberate that is uh, qualified in a, in a very strong way by a cultural way. Uh, um, could be practice like soccer, was allowed, was not allowed, could be able to behave, you know, personal distance or how to express emotions. I mean, to what level does those affect perhaps spontaneity or emotions or, or, or does it trickle down as well? I don't know, I'm just wondering. Do you want to? No, well, I think it's quite a mess. Actually, yeah. that, that you get a lot, you get a lot going on. You get a, a kind of automatic response. You get yeah. uh, uh, things you're used to doing. You could call them habits, I suppose. But yeah. the, they too, they, they was, they're voluntary in the sense that you could stop them if you wanted, you know. And mm -hmm. and they're, even there, there there are degrees uh, of being able to stop. I mean, it's, uh, and then there's uh, a kind of voluntary adding on, on uh, without it being very reflective and, and um, you can also reflect on the whole situation, decide you want to do, you want to go ahead with this and so forth. It's, it's, it's horribly, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, complicated. I mean, the, the degrees you get of these various factors coming in here. Um, I, just, I like this word, a mess. Um, it, I think uh, Freeman Dyson wrote a little bit about, um, you know, when we're talking about life, life is uh, DNA, you see. Well, it's not just DNA, it's metabolism as well. You have to have renewal processes, not just, right. I say, the two R's, reproduction and renewal. Right. You need both of those. You need both metabolism and, as it were, some kind of uh, informational basis. Uh, it's actually the same with coordination. People like coordination. They like to see the ordered uh, coordination. Uh, and it looks like synchrony and so on. And there's an awful lot of work going on. For example, last week I was at the Society for Neuroscience and there were many symposia on synchronization in the brain and oscillations in the brain that are cognitively relevant and behaviorally relevant and even emotionally relevant, actually. Uh, or that seem to have some correlation to the states of creatures. Uh, but actually, it turns out that uh, uh, synchronicity and oscillation is just one, the ordered part. And when you look more closely, it's a much more subtle uh, tendency to co synchronize and also a tendency for the parts to behave uh, autonomously, to do their own thing. So you have this uh, kind of duality of a tendency to cooperate and a tendency for the parts to do their own thing, almost compete. So you have this subtle cooperation, competition, integration, segregation. Uh, this is a, a key characteristic of, of, dynamics. of dynamics and coordination, you see. <laughs> so that's the, that's the beast, that's the mess that we have to recognize that uh, DNA metabolism, uh, the, how that's worked out is really not s still understood, even though we've got the genome and all that stuff. But uh, now we come to coordination in the brain that is underlying everything that's uh, uh, going on here in a way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that turns out, again, to be messier than the way we as scientists tend to think about it. Yeah, it's a mess in the sense that it's, it's not as simple as you'd like. Exactly. I mean, it's, not, it's, not, it's not too simple, but it's not too complicated. It's sort of in this nice place in between, and that's 
where we have to look at things closely, I think. But I think dynamics are challenging precisely because they're messier to, to understand and investigate than something solid and in place and that has spatial clarity and exists here and you can really look at it and yeah. dynamics is fluctuating and changing. Yes, so you, I mean the dynamics literally is spatial temporal. It's in space and in time. And in and force. And it has a flow. Well, there, there, were, there, there are underlying forces perhaps, right. yes. But in terms at least of the pattern dynamics, right. it's more uh, like this. It's, it's more uh, uh, spatial temporal. Yeah. So, any questions or comments? Yes. Um, I'd like to throw a couple of things out and then you can deal with them. You speak of importance, almost the necessity of movement for life. Um, at one point saying life and movement are one, I think I heard specifically was said. What about a quadriplegic you know, or someone in an iron lung? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. As to emotional response, uh, whether or not you're responsible for it, something inside you unconsciously reacts to something you hear and you respond consciously. Um, it reminds me a little bit of, a, uh, of, of Sam Harris's uh, explanation of free will, if in fact there is free will. Your example of the baby and synergy doesn't have to include consciousness. The synergy existed even as the baby was not conscious before the baby became conscious of the connection between his foot and the moving mobile. Um, and the last thing is deliberate against spontaneous. Deliberate, I, I, I don't have a dictionary, but Deliberate, I think, is conscious, spontaneous, is not conscious, unconscious. Um, so re horses changing their gates. Um, I believe, correct me if I'm mistaken, that horses' gates um, start as deliberate because they're learned and they become spontaneous. So I leave you with, with that. Let me suggest that you take, or that we all take one, because I would like to have other questions besides. So which, which one would you like to focus on? Well, uh, 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 let me, uh, the, 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 the questions are all a, a, a little bit connected, I think, in a way. But I, I think this important question you raise about the synergy is there before it's manifest. Is it really? How do you know that? that, that I mean, that, I don't know that, that, that that's true. But it occurs to me that uh, there's something I like about that idea. Um, in the sense that we study, for example, the synergies between people in interpersonal uh, coordination. We study, actually, uh, interbrain coordination, as it turns out. Yeah, And um, I think there's a very interesting question there about the relation between self and other, in the case of the baby, between the baby and the, the organism and the environment. Is the synergy there uh, beforehand? Does it pre-exist? The possibility, I think, coming to Jesus's point, exists. But it doesn't exist until it's manifest, in my opinion. Um, so uh, in the case of the self and the other, I think there's, uh, uh, <laughs> this may be taking us off in different directions, but I think, for example, the field of neuroscience has uh, stress the individual brain, the, you know, uh, je pense, uh, don je, je suis, I think, therefore I am. Uh, but and another way would be to say, I am uh, because you are. So there's a self-other. 
But the self-other doesn't pre-exist, it only exists in the relation of the two. And I think that's the same case of the baby. The, the synergy doesn't really exist until the conditions are set up that it can be manifest. That would be... Uh, does that sound so odd? It's, I, I, th I think in some cases, uh, you see, again, 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 uh, again, you, you, you what? I thought on a scientific level. Yes. I'm an amateur. Yes. But that's a synergy is, it either, it exists in some yeah. A, a, a synergy is a functional grouping of elements that are temporarily constrained to act as a single unit once more with feeling. A synergy is a, an assembly of elements temporarily constrained to function as a single unit. The question of how it arises, I, I mean we, that we could talk about that, but um, that would be the definition in, uh, in all the cases that we've been discussing. If I can. Now, whether that's conscious or unconscious, again, uh, uh, is, is the brain synchronized? Is it desynchronized? You see, we, we love to have this either-or logic, and I think where we're going to actually is more of a both-and logic uh, than an either-or. The, the synergy could be both conscious and unconscious quite think, easily. Yeah, that's a good complementarity all, point. All levels of that's yeah. actually exactly. to kind of exactly. bring up that it doesn't have to be an either or. Maybe it's complementary or could be also by degrees maybe. Yeah. So there are different levels of achievement synergy. It doesn't have to be full on synergy or completely lacking that or full on conscious or unconscious. It may also be swapping up around. For example, athletes, let's just speak about being in the zone or something like that, flow or mushing in martial arts, right? Um, and they say, well, that's when you're not thinking about it. But I think that's a misreading. What's really happening, you really pay attention to what's going on. They are both conscious and unconscious. There are some things which you kind of um, put in the, in the background, if you will. Mm -hmm. But there are some other things you are hyper alert to. So maybe you know, there are degrees and ways of being synergic or conscious of something. And you use them depending on what the goal is and the needs of, of, of the moment. That's maybe a possibility to open up. So it's not simply to have one or not and, and what are the conditions. And, and it could be a scientific level. It could be an experiential level. And the one that maybe matters to you when you're trying to solve a problem that you have in your face. You know, it could be very practical, so that's, I don't want to sleep on the eyes maybe. And the more attention I pay to it, maybe the more tricky it's all the way around. So I think it could be a combination maybe, or this is a suggestion. Another question, Ed? I'd like to hear a little more thought about agency, which came up very early on, but we didn't really return to it. Uh, I think we've got elements of agency here, spontaneity, consciousness. One thing was left out. Um, it seems like agency would require a sense that, that movement produces an effect in the environment uh, that that I, although not yet an ego uh, in any formal or strict sense, can make a difference by my movement to the configuration of a given environment. That seems different from modes of movement that really may make no difference. Idle movement, we could call them, just moving, <laughs> so to speak, uh, producing no effect and not actually, therefore, uh, tempting us to ascribe the movement to an agent. I don't mean a full-blown agent, I don't mean a rational agent, I don't even mean a conscious agent, but I mean um, some kind of being who, uh, by moving, actually insinuates itself into the world in such a way that the world comes out a little bit different, if only the mobile moving slightly. Um, so somehow in this series of terms that you've all been developing richly and, 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 and I think um, uh, paying due attention, respecting their deep ambiguity. That's one thing I really enjoy. No one's coming across with definitions that we need to adhere to. You're actually exploring, I think, the penumbra of all these terms. But, but agency is, I think, still suspended in the air. And I wonder if we could return to it briefly uh, and now say, what, uh, where is agency? Who is the agent? And how is agency related to motion, to movement? And Ed, could you give an example of what you mean by um, uh, a less 
definitive agency when you said that there's no impact on well, the world? Well, I don't want to have a Cartesian agency, or I don't want to have a, you know, a, a mind. No, uh, but I mean, if I go like that. Yeah, if I just go like that, you know, and I'm really doing it, I would say, like, flapping my wings to no effect, as we say in English, right? Then I'm not sure that's agency. Mm -hmm. It's movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Well, that's sort of the what I was getting at. Yeah, how, how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. Is that a lower level, you, you see? Uh, do we reach a level of non-agentive movement here? Maybe we call that... Involuntary. Although I actually suspect that the class, that that class of non-agent-driven movement is sometimes voluntary and sometimes heads toward the barely voluntary. But it's not really a matter of agency. So I wondered if yeah. you folks could Interesting. comment on that puzzle. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Wait a second. You have agency at all different levels. You know, I mean, it. it Unless you want to define agent to rule out some of the levels, I mean, uh, if, if I just, if I'm doing that, if I'm shaking my foot like that, and, uh, and if I'm aware of, um, of the thing, just, well, vaguely aware, it's, it's there in the background, uh, I'm still the agent. I'm not the agent in the, in the way in which I scratch my head, for example. There, I'm, you know, I have an itch and I know what I'm doing. And it, I direct my fingers accordingly. I, here, I don't know, a little bit over here, Bert, and, and so forth. You know, um, but still, uh, that's an essential part of this thing going on. I'm not unconscious, and this is not a twitch. This is something I'm doing, um, but my participation is minimal. You know, so you you have agents, if you like, at, at, at a lot of different levels. And uh, I don't know what to do with that. It just seems to me that's the way the world is. There's a mm. comment from, yes. I can't stand. It's okay. Okay, I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the advantage of having a stroke, by the way, in my movement center. So my right side is different from my left. I'm also the president of Laban Institute of Movement Studies. Mm. <laughs> So, irony of all ironies, now I have also a radio show. I'm very interested in the movements of the sound of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've had a very mm -hmm. interesting journey from no control of my trunk or my head mm -hmm. to finally being able to move. Amazing. And in the process, I've had a lot of interaction, say, with Honey, my dear friend, who both drives and does her thing, and she also walks me. What is the gate? I was famous, pardon, for, for the fact that I could look at the gate and say there is no gate. Everyone moves differently. So Laban was probably the first person to look at movement and say there is a language here. There are symbols to be used. There is continuity. There are spheres. There are movements that are not linear. And very circular in nature, and that there, as you said, Maxine, the qualitative aspects interest me very, very much, both recuperating from my stroke, which I'm going to talk about at NYU later in April, but still fascinating to me was that there is no gate in my language. There is no linear non-agent involved in movement. There is only movement and its qualitative differences in all aspects of movement. So when you have a sperm who cannot move like other sperms, it moves differently. It meets an egg that moves differently. How does it move differently? And a zygote occurs that suddenly moves differently from all other zygotes. It's you. So what your phrase is instantaneously Beyond that, believe me, there are even hypnotists who say, well, we actually know consciously there is an agent before we are, quote, born and conceived, that we listened to what was said. There are people that have many different opinions, and yes, we are in a mess in terms of movement, but where are you interested? What is your particular take? It's wonderful to hear everyone's different takes 
and my different take because of what I have experienced, both socially and individually, etc. I'm very, very interested in all of what you say. Maxine, I'm most interested in hearing the qualitative differences, as I said, in movement. And I will once again say Ermgard Bachinyev was my mentor, but Laban really gave me the opportunity, crudely, caveman level that Laban was at, the opportunity to look at movement as something other than English words. Very important. Then English words like gate, et cetera, and it's very helpful I've, I've, to me. Just to make a side comment, I've been told many times by many people who do Laban analysis, that the phenomenology of movement that I gave in the phenomenology of dance coincides very, in very complementary ways with Laban analysis. Thank you. Somebody had a question back here, yes. May I just make a comment just before you start? Um, um, I, I like the idea of qualitative differences, of course, and I had early experiences with uh, Laba notation as well. Um, the, um, uh, actually, I think this, I mean, one, one needs to be careful about using words. Uh, uh, when I used the word gait, I meant a pattern of coordination between the legs. Uh, if I was looking at a person who had a stroke, I would be looking at the pattern of connectivity in their brain. And I've done that as well. Uh, so uh, the qualitative effects come when the patterns change. right? Not just smoothly and linearly, as you elegantly say, but qualitatively. And in fact, the the example of an animal changing gait, if you pardon, you know, changing the ordering among its components, is a qualitative change, uh, in the same sense as uh, a physical system uh, like water changes from uh, ice to uh, liquid. It's a qualitative change. There's nothing wrong with the word qualitative, and it turns out it has many quantitative consequences, important conse uh, quantitative consequences for, uh, for these kinds of changes. So um, that's really, uh, you know, uh, let's talk about qualitative effects. Uh, the key thing from a scientific point of view would be uh, the differences on what dimensions. You see, and uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah, but the, the, yeah, yeah, but that's that's precisely again. Here's another dichotomy: qualitative versus quantitative. Please don't see those as a dichotomy. See them as actually complementary and mutually related. They they, they are they are and indeed uh, actually uh, it's quite beautiful. They are mutually related. There are quantitative consequences of qualitative change that can be picked up and used as signatures for uh, predicting the upcoming change and so on. And it is our, our uh, duty, I was going to say, to really try to fathom the way in which they are related, to find the complement, uh, this is a term of uh, Scott's, to find the complementarity between the two rather than to keep perseverating on these dual paths. If I can just very briefly, one very quick thing, and we we'll go to the right. <laughs> it was just to kind of connect your two, two issues you raised. You raised at one point a paraplegic or people who are not able to move in an able way, if you will, right? And somebody who has maybe a stroke, right, who finds not able to move the way you, you would like to or like most people, right? And I think another way to explore the qualitative aspect of movement, or, or quantitative as well, is when we look at, for example, we like to think of disabled people. And, and I think to some extent they move in different ways qualitatively. They experience it differently. But yet, I think there are patterns of excellence as well among them. I have in mind, for example, somebody called Kevin Nichols, who is a, a skier who doesn't have any lower body, no legs, nothing. But he's got an advantage in the ski slopes because his liberal gravity is lower. He can do things nobody can do, so nobody can follow him, <laughs> right? So in a way, I think this is a way we might discount. Well, you look at him and people in the street, he walks in a, in a skateboard. 
where he just goes like this really fast and people do double takes, right? And he actually likes to take pictures of people looking at him because they are surprised. <laughs> so he's making the most of it. But going back to, to the two of you, I think there are ways to look at um, deficient movement, if you will. That's how we like to qualify it, right? And we're already given a negative label. But I think there are ways to think of it in different categories, which is a, it's an alternate way, alternative way to move that has its own qualities. And actually, sometimes you can explore it to your advantage. Okay, so I think there are ways or rooms or, or spaces to open up uh, in terms of exploration that I think would enrich how we look at movement uh, in, in meaningful ways. It's, it's very, it's, it's, sorry, it's, it's very, very interesting. A, a concept that hasn't come up here has to do with stability. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, uh, the stability, we want to know the stability of what and so on. But the very interesting thing about qualitative change is that qualitative changes are associated with what engineers don't like, which is instabilities. Instabilities create new possibilities. They create new patterns. And that's a key dynamic. That's a key part of the dynamics. Yes. Thanks. That was very elegant and interesting. Uh, discussion, and this is ra rather much more mundane, but I'm curious to ask, going back to the baby, about infant reflexes, which have an agency that is deeply buried in the organism for survival, but is certainly not conscious because they're reflexes. And in fact, when they become conscious, they, they, they we have control over them and basically um, extinguish them. So I'm wondering if you can talk about infant reflexes, which are movements, which have an as I said, a, a deep intentionality that is not conscious for the survival of the creature. And when they become conscious, they actually become extinguished. Maybe you want to address that. Um... Moral reflex, sucking reflex. Some reflexes, I guess we retain fight flight, but the basic infant reflexes, when they become These integrated. These are used as signs of uh, well, integrity. They, and so. they, they're, they're for the survival of our yeah. very being. So mm -hmm. deeply within the body, they are intentional, but they're not conscious. And when they become conscious, we stop them. That's when, that's when they become integrated. So I'm wondering if you guys can talk about that. Do you have any examples of I mean, uh, the moral reflex? I mean, as far as I can tell, it doesn't become extinct. It, it just it, it, uh, it changes its solicitor, if you like. It, it's, uh, it, it's a way of of responding, and a baby responds if you take away uh, support, it responds like that. But then I respond like that if somebody makes a big, a, no, a loud noise behind me, you know, I go like that. Well, uh, the integration uh, of the reflexes is when they become conscious and we can, we can control them consciously. They're reflexes because we have no control over them when we're infants because they help us survive. But then once they become integrated, we do have the conscious control over them. Uh, and we, said we essentially then can, can stop them from being reflexes. So the, 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 the idea of agent there is slightly different. And I was wondering if you could talk about it, because it's not conscious, conscious. The agent of the body to survive is huge when you're in the state of the baby. But it's not a conscien conscious agent, because it's the reflex. Mm -hmm. So. I, I, would, I would simply say that there's a, it, it's a bit anecdotal, but there's a beautiful study by a Japanese investigator called Fukuda, where he shows all these sports examples uh, uh, where the primitive reflex, the crossed extensor reflexes, all these reflexes are in highly skilled sports, like a baseball player going up for a, f a, f a fly ball. So it looks as if these, quotes reflexes, these basic patterns, these primitive patterns, are actually exploited for uh, in highly skilled behavior. Exactly. Now, the question of consciousness and so on, I can't really speak to, but uh, nevertheless, I think there's a point really with respect to what you say that um, these basic patterns are a foundation for uh, uh, all volitional movement and skilled behavior. Uh, and that's been ignored, I agree. <laughs> As a postscript, a small postscript, I would just say that neurologically, the first systems to develop are, the, are kinesthesia, which is a totally overlooked sense modality for, for centuries, and uh, tactility, tactility and kinesthesia. And 
it seems to me since those are the very first neurological systems to develop that there has to be some kind of initial consciousness developing with respect to them because fetuses go th have a lot of different movements that they that they generate by themselves and there must be some if their neurological system is developing normally they have a sense of their own movement and touch so consciousness is is has its has its origin guess, in yeah, tactile kinesthetic quick in what um, I call the tactile kinesthetic body. <laughs> Go I ahead. Just a quick follow up to that, to tie to the issue of agency very quickly. The example you gave of the striker who is with the hand, mm -hmm. that was a reflex for him. Yeah. He knows he's not supposed to be with the hand, but he wants so badly to score, the hand goes there, right? Or was he knows it's not gonna count. I mean, he gets away with it, it's lucky him. Yeah. But one thing is in terms of who is really responsible, well, to some extent you could say he's to be blamed because by the, by, by the referee, it doesn't count because you were the agent. At the same time, we would say, well, the arm, he could say, he just did it, he just went, I didn't meant to do it, right? So there is maybe in the same system, the same agent, there could be maybe a sub-level or a subconscious or unconscious, and I think they tend to flip back and forth or complement sometimes on what's required. So I think there is a connection there. I, I have a slightly different response to Ed's question, and that is that I would call a cooperativity mm -hmm. that is, you know, obviously it involves coordination and cooperation among the muscles and the uh, kinesthetic support and so on, uh, but, um, uh, a cooperativity with an effect like the evolutionarily stable strategy of the two men each with an oar uh, in which you know the defection scenario that's cooperation with an effect and that's where I think the agency aspect is part of a functional synergy it's not a functional synergy if you just have a cooperativity it's only a functional synergy if you produce a consequence that is going to have evolutionary uh, outcomes right First of all, thank you. I'm completely fascinated and really enjoying all of you. Um, I'm wondering when you talk about consciousness and the degrees of consciousness, I'm thinking about agency, uh, excuse me, awareness. Mm -hmm. And awareness as the relationship of organism of an, and environment, and then consciousness as person world. I wonder if you can say something about that, uh, the developing of consciousness from Am I clear? Well, I would say to begin with, and I hope that the others bolster me in this, uh, what I said uh, to begin with is it just seems to me that the tactile kinesthetic body is basic to the beings we are. In other words, kinesthesia and tactility are basic senses, and we recognize commonly five senses and disregard our own sense of movement, which is kinesthesia. Uh, a long time ago, Aristotle looked upon movement as a sensu communis. In other words, it was a sense that is common to all the senses. And he elaborated on this in very fine ways, but he didn't ever speak of our sense of movement, which has to do with precisely with the qualitative dynamics. We know if we're going like this, or if we're going like this, or if we're going in a... We, we have a sense of the dynamics, the qualitative dynamics of our own movement. And um, when Gibson went on to talk about affordances and about a sense of communis in terms of vision and movement, he completely obliterated, to my mind, any real adequate, just minimally adequate sense of kinesthesia. It was all about getting, navigating in, in the environment, but not really uh, delving into the basic um, kinesthetic awareness we have of our own bodies in movement. So anything that anyone wants to add to that tirade? <laughs> I guess I have a quick follow-up question. What do you mean by the world? Um, what do you have in mind? You, you have in mind the environment or, or us connecting with the world? Yeah, the environment. Okay, I guess what I was thinking is you just kind of work. It's biological and one is uh, interpersonal. Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking this now, but organism and environment sounds biological. Mm -hmm. And organism, organism isn't? Uh, well, but there is a biology. We 
we've been talking about conscious and unconscious and levels of consciousness and reflexes. And I wanted to share a personal experience I had. When I was 13, I had an accident. Um, I was playing football, <clears throat> and um, I was paralyzed in my right leg for three years, and I was in a back brace. And in I did. What? I was in a back brace for three years, as my um, my spine and tailbone had been pulled apart, and a lot of ligaments were torn out, and this leg didn't work. So I remember when the doctor tapped me, and there was no reflex response. Uh, we knew we had a problem. But I recovered, and years later, about 20 years later, I was in a hypnosis class, and we did some age regression, and we went back and um, into my 20s and into my teens, and I talked about experiences from each of those periods. And then when I hit 15, all of a sudden, my leg was paralyzed again. It went totally numb, and, it, and I couldn't move it. Even though I was in my 30s and the accident had happened in my teens, I uh, re-experienced that in a very compelling way. And then they moved me, and I was able to talk about it, uh, an adult part of my mind was able to track it, my response to this new relationship I was having to this previous injury. But then they moved me into my, um, when I was 12, before the accident happened, and my leg could move again. So I'm just throwing this out there because it was a very fascinating experience for me um, to be able to relive this experience. So I, before the accident, my reflexes were working. Then the accident happened, and there was uh, this disconnect, disconnect and uh, the reflexes weren't there. Then I was uh, healed because I was young enough. Uh, this, it was corrected by the back brace. Um, so the reflexes were there again. But then, as an adult, I could revisit imaginatively in a trance state, um, not having that reflex response again. And I'm wondering, you know, how fluid and malleable and dynamic the brain mind world is. Mm -hmm. And another question I have this is just off the top of my head um, how can my mind be separate from anyone's body, anyone else's body? I think this is how could my mind be separate from your body? I'm curious about that because it seems to me we, we, we talk about brain a lot as something separate from other brains, um, mm -hmm. brain, mind, body, world. Uh, so I hope there's a question there. Uh, I'm just throwing this out there. <laughs> so thank you very much for allowing me to share this experience. Uh, well, let me walk backwards from the point that you were raising, how we connect with the world maybe, and our minds or our bodies. So I think maybe trying to, to really speak of brain, mind and, bra and body separate or brain is part of the problem. I think, you know, to some extent, we read each other's language through our bodies, right? And we respond to each other's behavior, movements, actions, in particular ways. So I think to some extent we're united, common, in virtue of we share a way of moving the world and, and, and a kind of a virtual space, if you will, right? A, a human space. Or with other creatures that move as well. And I think to some extent we connect with that in, in, in a very unconscious way, you know, very primeval way, if you will, until we start to explore it. And I think part of exploring this, one question we came up with over dinner, but we don't have time to bring up, is different methodologies, disciplines to study movement. And I think, for example, the, the episode you relate, I, I, I can think from, we have a scientific explanation, we can have philosophical ones in phenomenology, but I can think also, for example, psychoanalysis playing a role, or even you know, literature to explore different ways of, of how that's felt. And I think you know, when we try to go through those experiences, sometimes most of us are lacking in the vocabulary to articulate exactly what is it that it means to me or, or what's the quality of it. And it's developing that, those tools, those linguistic abilities to speak about it and understand it after the fact, if you will. On the one side, I see there is movement and its richness. At the same time, I want to understand it, not simply um, as I move, although I enjoy doing that, but also articulate it, if you will, in different, in different ways. And I think different methodologies and patterns are needed to, especially with complex things like, like your experience. Yes, Jill? very minimal uh, notion of what dance is, uh, but I've been involved in music since I was about nine, playing the cello, and I started taking lessons again recently with a 30-something expert, 
and I'd never like to play scales. But now I'm in control of the situation, and he teaches what I ask him about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so he said, "Okay, let's let's do it." I mean, he he thought I did it, but I I had avoided it my whole life. So he said, "All right, start uh, start on uh, D major, so the first finger on the cello, and then before you play the next note, hear it and go up the scale, and no open strings." That is, play only notes that require pressure from a digit. Because open strings don't train the left hand at all. There's no, there's no left hand. Mm -hmm. So I did it. I was surprised how, it, how in tune. It was, it was in tune. And I, did, I hadn't practiced D major scale. And he says, when the top basketball player shoots for the three-pointer, he visualizes the ball going through the net. And similarly, the tennis player or the golfer who has to sink the putt visualizes the ball rolling into the hole. What you're doing, he says, is you're suspending your mental interference. And your body knows very well, your body's done it a, a thousand, a million times. Let your body do it. So I, I assume there's some overlap here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting comment. Very. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, there's there's a lot of wisdom in your remarks about um, how you come back to something that you haven't done in the past, and I think you know if when we all leave this place, I hope you don't think we're talking only about reflexes and stuff. I mean, we're really talking about uh, generative, creative movement. And I think that's really important. You see, what you're talking about in the case of producing an effect in the world in terms of sound, uh, actually, we're, uh, infants, when they develop uh, uh, to speak, they are doing the same. You're producing sounds, and that is lawfully produced by the way your uh, articulators move and, and, and the way you sense your articulators, where your tongue is and so on. So there's an intimate connection, and you would, you see, you, you never really forget how to speak unless you've had some severe insult and so on. So I think it's like that, that these become stabilized, and uh, how they destabilize then uh, can be part of, you know, uh, producing new sounds as if you would want to learn a new language, for instance. And there's quite a lot of work, again, on that, that you're actually building on what you have and adjusting the dynamics of what you have and the acoustic consequence that those dynamics produce. And that's a key aspect, I think. I, I would add to that that um, um, I think that there is a lot to be said for the imaginative consciousness. Um, I can describe that in terms of the imaginative consciousness of movement, but what you're talking about, it seems to me, is on the imaginative consciousness of sound, where what used to be called mental practice actually enhances your performance because the body really does take over and you can, this is an example from movement, I can remember it from, from uh, movement classes, I would imagine myself going through some kind of movement and I knew that this was wrong imaginatively, no I had to do it this way. I could actually correct myself imaginatively and improve what I, whatever I was doing. But I think what you're saying is that hearing the the sound, let, letting yourself hear the sound, is really going on your your um, your bodily felt sense of the sound, just like or the bodily felt sense of the movement and how it. Uh, I don't know whether to use the term dynamics there, but it has a certain kind of quality. The sound has a certain kind of quality, and your body knows that sound already and how to how to. How to make it come it. Yeah. come to the fore, yeah. how to create it. Sometimes speaking of visualizing is a little misleading because we tend to think, we simply imagine with our mind's eye, but when I try to visualize different moves in, in my sports, I actually feel it through my body. 
yeah. Uh, so, so visualizing in a way throws us off a little bit in trying to think it's like an image and that's all suffices. So it could be oral, it could be tactile kinesthetic. You know, when I'm trying to think in the pool how to do certain moves and I visualize it, I do feel this tingling in my arms or this feeling where I really pay attention. So I think there is a richness of interconnection of our senses. That, that, that we have to pay attention to. Yeah, it's actually Often. very, sorry, it, it's a very interesting that if yeah. you do have a stroke, for instance, and you, uh, the person can only move the left hand, say it's a right hemisphere stroke, something like that, uh, and you say, uh, imagine moving your hands together the way we normally do, uh, and if you really uh, work at that, actually you can show that there's a, a degree of recovery of function. Uh, and there's published research on that. And there's also a lot of published research that when you imagine to move, many of the same neural structures right. are exactly. activated yeah. and coordinated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these are, this is not magic. <laughs> oh. This is clearly articulated. Um, my question is actually about what you had mentioned about uh, emotions moving through the body. So the movement of a feeling. Now, perhaps emotion and feeling are not the same there. That I'm wondering if, if that's true, then what would be, what is the feeling of the movement of a mixed feeling, like ambivalence um, or some other sort of, maybe that's an emotion. I'm just, I, I was thinking a lot about those sorts of situations. Because I can envision what you talk about, and I think I've experienced that as well. I know what it feels like for joy to, to move through my body, or one of the ways. And I know what it feels like for sadness to move through my body, but I'm not quite sure how it feels for bittersweetness or ambivalence or anything like that. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, you'd have to uh, maybe engage in some phenomenological methodology and really, not on a lazy Sunday afternoon, but really, um, um, this goes into uh, phenomenological analysis, but at least begin by introspecting as to what your experience actually is. I mean, if, when you feel ambivalent about something, what are the tensions that run through your body? What are the spatial inclinations that you feel to do or not to do? What is the kind of, of, uh, of maybe uh, incipient movements and pauses that you feel uh, inclined toward? Like you, there are some kinds of temporal aspects to it too. Uh, also, if you feel ambivalence, there's a certain kind of, uh, is there an ambivalence in terms of, or a changing uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, um, that was more or less mentioned in terms of tension, but also in terms of the way in which you feel impelled toward moving in a certain way spatially, or feel more hesitant or... Uh, in a s slower kind of way. So in other words, just begin at least by introspecting and seeing. And actually, in a Jungian sense actually too, Jung went in, I'm not a Jungian analyst at all, but uh, the whole idea of exploring something through artistic uh, manifestations, you could even begin by uh, just finding out, just starting moving. I'm feeling ambivalent. What do I feel like? <laughs> yeah. Just to give something concrete, I'm someone who is very indecisive. Okay? So, blue shirt, white shirt, blue shirt, white shirt. I don't know. And I keep going back and forth. Or if I want to buy, I have money for only one book. And there are two books I really want. Okay? And I'm in the computer screen. I can go back and forth. And it's just my body. And I feel this inside of me, you know, physically, you know, this, this discomfort that pulls me in different ways. This way, way we're speaking that way, right? So pay attention to those feelings. You know, pick next time you have to choose maybe a shirt to wear or something like that. Okay, or, or something else, right? You chose yeah, a great one for tonight, you but go. you know. So try to think, well, what's happening? How do I feel right now? Introspect. And there are different methodologies that they take you further. She mentioned phenomenology, it's a little more complicated, but by paying attention to that at first and trying to see, well, what is it unique about this experience? That's also common to somebody else who speaks of the same experience as being decisive. This is what I'm feeling. Do you feel this way? What do we have in common? Maybe try to extrapolate from there. 
uh, as you explore this. Um, because I think there is this kind of either or state, which sometimes is great when they coincide, this synergy, sometimes it pulls you apart. <laughs> you have this, <laughs> these two goals, which one do I want, right? It's like Bori dance donkey. There is hay on both sides and he does for starvation. We don't know which one to eat. So <laughs> anyway, I'll leave you with that thought. <laughs> there, 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 is, there is something, I think, uh, very nice about being in this in-between place mm -hmm. that uh, we off, you, you see it as a, a negative in a way but I think there's also something very enlightened about being in the in-between place so that you can see uh, dispositions uh, multiple dispositions at the same time and those um, are synergies and those are synergies those are, those are synergies <laughs> I was those just going to say I mean Maxine uh, uh, one of the first times uh, that we interacted was uh, going back to these gates and actually I was at Yale at the time we could only study finger movements and I discovered a kind of uh, transition between antiphase and in-phase switching one night sitting thinking about how can my fingers do the walking you see like out of an analogy again and then uh, turning that into a real experiment but uh, Maxine wrote once, you know, that that kind of gate transition, that kind of phase, it turned out that that was a phase transition, <laughs> a qualitative change. Uh, and uh, uh, you analogized it with the idea itself. Ideation is a phase transition. So you have new things come up. And uh, that can be uh, actually taken advantage. You've got coexisting states, and then you uh, can create a new thing. So it can be positive. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. You buy the 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 rest, not the blue white.